Hello, everyone, and welcome to an Emacs chat. I'm talking to Wasamasa, who had a fascinating five-minute demo of, of graphics in Emacs at yesterday's Emacs Conf. So we figured we'd follow up with a full-length chat into demonstration presentation thing. Uh, so yeah, um, here he is. Actually, uh, Wasamasa, can you switch back to your video first so people can get a sense of who you are and, uh, and uh, what you like? Oh, uh, no, the thing is, I don't actually have a webcam or anything. Oh, yeah, okay, Nothing built in, no external all right. one. So, that's yeah. totally all right. OK, so let's jump into it. Well, actually, before we go into the demonstration, that, tell me a little bit about how you got started with Emacs and, uh, and you, know, what, you know, what got you into it. Well, um, actually, I, I was studying computer science and uh, had to do an internship at a place. And one of my tasks there was to um, revamp a um, manual about setting up the server. And my predecessor, he had a note in it that uh, one should use something like Vim or Emacs as the editor, but forgot to edit a tutorial. So that was one of the first things I've added. And um, I've decided to just try out Emacs and Vim. I started off mm -hmm. with Wim first because it seemed a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. And I actually kept using it for about six months, something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I found a few things I wasn't really fine with, like um, its syntax highlighting for LaTeX was very, very slow. And so that wasn't acceptable because I did the I did my menu in LaTeX. And yeah. so I needed something better than this. And it wasn't really customizable. and. I'm really, really picky about this. So um, I decided to just try out Emacs because I've heard it had this um, great Vim emulation thing <laughs> called Evil. And it just hit 1.0. So I thought it must be good. And it actually was. It wow. actually was. It took, me, it took me quite a bit to get used to it because um, it's it's very different. It's the same story in Vim. I, I am a slow learner. and. It took me about two weeks to just get used to it and have something like notepad efficiency in it. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, with Emacs, it took me two weeks to learn how to do basic navigation. It then I used Evil, and from then on, I progressed slowly. Wow. So um, yeah, I've been using it for about a year before I started actually learning Emacs Lisp, and a year later, I did my first talk at Frostcon. Where I wow. just did, yeah yeah in this talk I I did demonstrate why you should learn Emacs Lisp and uh, did demonstrate some of the things I'm well, I'm going to show here and uh, this year this would be my third year of Emacs I have demonstrated more graphical things only and a bit more what you uh, should know before you want to do the next Mario or some shoot or anything <laughs> in it that's excellent so, yeah there you that's go. Amazing. I'm glad you found a, a, a an editor that accommodates your pickiness. Uh, Emacs is very very good for that, and it's great yeah. that you you picked up so much in just a year of you know learning things. Uh, you, after a year, you went to Emacs Lisp, and now you're after a couple of years now you, you're you're doing all sorts of fascinating things. So yeah, computer science. Like, what what else are you interested in outside of Emacs? Well, other than this, I'm, of course, uh, the, all the natural sciences, like uh, I'm very interested in physics, chemistry, and all that stuff. And uh, outside it, I like doing photography. And oh. yeah, uh, recently, one of my coworkers um, yeah, uh, told me we should totally hit up the gym, so I'm doing weightlifting there. <laughs> and yeah, there's a lot of interesting things out there. So. Um, I'm always interested in if someone has something interesting to go at and pursue that if it's cool enough for me. Mm -hmm. Are you using Emacs to help with any of those other interests? Well, not really. I I had first the idea that I should totally use Orgmo to organize my life, but um, it's just too big to be really <laughs> mastered. So I'm only losing it for very basic things like uh, my talks and cal a calendar because uh, there's this really cool package, KLFV, which displays an ASCII calendar of all your org stuff. And yeah, I have to other check than that, that, I out. use it for project documentation. Oh, maybe if you don't have a sensitive information on your calendar at the moment, then you can include that in one of your oh. demonstrations No, later. it's just my current schedule for uh, university. 
Awesome. Okay, by the way, we already have a viewer uh, watching this stream. So if you have any questions but, um, or uh, if you're watching this afterwards as well, uh, feel free to submit them through the built-in Q&A app or by commenting on the event page and I'll pass them on to Wasama. So, so, yeah, so that's, the, that's the calendar that you're talking about with, uh, you know, 945 and, and other things like that. That's, that is really cool. Okay, so I um, play well with that font size, though. Well, that's that's okay. I, uh, I'm, I'm sure it looks really nice in a, a larger, yep. uh, larger resolution. It's more font size. Okay, so one of the things that I really want to follow up on is um, is a graphics demo that you did yesterday with Tetris yes. and the Game of Life and whatever. You mentioned this was a 45 minute talk originally. So, so let's let's go over for something in between the five minute demo that you did, uh, which was a very great overview um, and something like a little bit more fleshed out. What are the sorts of things that you wish you had time to share yesterday? Um, I would have liked to share how, how this all actually works because um, this was very quick, even at the yeah. original talk. Um, yeah. I had the impression that I've just left people speechless pretty much because I didn't get any questions or anything just to pause at the end and yeah so I would have really liked to explain why buffers can do this kind of thing why it's actually fast enough and what the mechanics are behind all of this oh and, for sure uh, yes because this doesn't really seem like um actually researched area if we can speak of research with emacs of course so um mm -hmm. yeah I've started a blog recently, and I guess I would use it to write about that kind of stuff there. For if I sure. don't have anything important. Oh, I, I think that's important enough to share for sure. Uh, so well, how, how does it work? I mean, a lot of people think of Emacs as a text editor, and I know it can display you know, graphics. It can even display animations. But what's, what does, how does the code actually work to do all these things? Well, uh, it all starts with buffers because um, in Emacs, strings aren't uh, the first class data type like in other languages. You instead work on the buffer instead. And um, buffers have many interesting properties. You can, for example, think of them as a string, of course. Um, they are basically a string at the beginning, a string at the end, and a gap between, which have given them the name gap buffer. And um, yeah, there are properties attached to them. For example, if you open a C file in Emacs, you are very likely going to see a syntax highlighted buffer. And this is because there is a mode that attaches to the parts of the text in it various properties, which are commonly called text properties. And uh, one of these is the face property, which tells it to use a certain syntax highlighting information. And that allows this effect. There are, of course, a few more. Most of them aren't as prominent as uh, faces, but um, one of the uh, one of the um, properties I'm using there for my demonstrations is the so-called display property. And uh, this property is special because Emacs uses it to tell the display engine to do something different than usual, like, for example, displaying an image. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's basically it. I manipulate a buffer, tell it to display an image, and later I delete that part of the buffer and replace it again. And if you do this often enough, you can, for example, get an animation or a game. Uh, OK, let's see one of those animations then. <laughs> OK, um, I guess I'd grab for this the uh, XBM demo. Sure. Nice. You said actually that you can get this going pretty fast. You, I think you mentioned 60 frames a second. Uh, yes, this was your... for a different demonstration, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one doesn't really do this yet. Mm -hmm. So. Um... Cool. <laughs> yeah, this would be just the classic glider. And yeah, yeah everyone should know this, actually. but. It's a pretty nice demonstration to make. It doesn't really take much time. In fact, um, I did this because uh, at the place I work at, everyone had, uh, I mean, almost everyone had to do this in the interview to demonstrate that they can program <laughs> and they could do it in any language they wanted. So um, I thought I'd, I'd do it as well, but this time in Emacs and yeah, that's my result because there's already an Emacs actually, an ASCII one, but it's not as interesting and more useful as a screen uh, saver. 
did your interviewer get how crazy and awesome that is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it helps out finding the candidates that can actually write code, and that's pretty important if you're going to be a programmer somewhere. Yeah. But um, not all places do this. That's very Some... cool. And all all you're doing there is you're changing the display uh, uh, attribute for like what a single character or. Um, no, this is single image there. I so see. Um, yeah, so in Emacs you would take a string like a space. You would uh, add a text property to it, the display property with the image data. I see. And then insert it into the buffer. And then later you erase the buffer and do this again. And this happens at a constant interval, which I can increase and decrease here. Would you mind showing us a little bit of that code and kind of how, oh, sure. whether it looks really, really complex or it's actually surprisingly simple? It's not that hard. If I, for example, scroll, um, OK, this would, of course, be the predefined patterns which aren't that interesting. Uh, yeah, this, for example, would be the image rendering function. All right, let's increase the font size a little bit to make it easier to see. OK, so you have a vector with the images with a bitmap in it. And, uh, and you basically just set that. <laughs> I'll let you explain it. How's that? <laughs> OK. Um, so this function takes a vector. That, that was already correct. So um, it has to calculate the size. And uh, yeah, we are iterating over the vector because um, for the data type we are using in XBM image, we need a so-called bool vector, which is just uh, lots of bits, which you can manipulate directly. So um, yeah, we create one to alter. And um, yeah, we go over the. Um, Oh, we do here an upscaling trick, actually, <laughs> as I can see. Um, I don't know. Do you do you know yeah. the pixel game style upscaling where you get a yeah. really jacked look? That's yeah, basically yeah. what I'm doing here, and um, I'm uh, iterating over two vectors at once for this. Uh, mm -hmm. Once over the original, and once over the um, one we want to put the bits in. So um, we just do an integer um, division, and uh, therefore figure out that in uh, an area we could all uh, we can put all the same bits into it. Into another area, another value for the bits, and therefore we get an upscaled look, which looks very uh, retro-like. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I unfortunately can't uh, demonstrate it here because uh, a second. Um, I, for some reason, the increasing doesn't really seem to work. That's OK. I'm sure you'll fix it some other time. But I can see how that bool vector you have, uh, the vector of Boolean, so, so either true or false, translates into this monochrome image. But I know some yes. of your other demos have colors in them. So how do you do that? Uh, that's actually done with another image type. And uh, mm -hmm. in the Tetris demo, I've used XPM. This is a textual image um, type. You can just create it in an Emacs buffer or directly manipulate a string. And I went for the latter for uh, reasons I will explain later. But um, a short version of it is that um, it supports colors. And that's why I've used it for the Tetris, because it needs colors. Not mm -hmm. more than 256, but a certain amount of them. And yeah, I did want to test out how suitable the image type is for actually doing anything in it. So there's XPM and XPM you mentioned, um, and SVG, I think you've also mentioned that as. Yes, yes, that would be the most flexible type. It's used in browsers all over the place because uh, people have found out these, these are very convenient to create. Mm -hmm. And um, they are text too, but more like XML. So mm -hmm. you'd need an XML generating library, which uh, do exist for Emacs Lisp. And yeah, you transform a tree into XML and that can be done very easily because you can just uh, tell it to take a part and replace it with another one by backquoting and unquoting. Could okay. um, show this too. Second. So um, yeah, this this would be the main function doing this. I um, I temporarily define some values like the field width, height, actual width and height. Um, mm -hmm. I temporarily find here a function for transforming a number to a string because always type a numbered string was getting <laughs> too much work for me. And, uh, yeah, this is this is just a, a, a tree where everything, almost everything, is kept as is, like um, 
SVG starts with an SVG declaration and some uh, attributes. And here I'm replacing the width attribute with the actual calculated width. And the same mm -hmm. for the height. And later yeah. I uh, use the same trick to like, like um, where I want original background, default background, loop to uh, all that I need. I actually change the game over or game one. Yeah, I see. And, I, and I really like that. that um, works pretty well for things. Yeah, I really like the, the fact that you're using SXML, which I guess takes S expressions and turns them into XML without all that extra cruft that you would get if you had to just yes, concat yes, the right. or whatever. That's awesome. I've never actually used that. That's great. Okay, so you've got yeah. you've got different ways of generating the actual image data, uh, and can we like take a step back to the XBM that you had before and show us just how you're setting the display attribute, which I know is, is super straightforward, um, or at least I think it is. But I want people to see how straightforward and non-intimidating it actually is. I'm hoping it isn't. <laughs> you want to see the actual image? The, uh, the part where you set attribute. You so uh, you know how you you mentioned that this is an yeah this is just an attribute oh, on. Okay, put me the redrawing. Um, I'm getting again. slightly choppy audio. Also, hang on a second. Uh, let me let me adjust my bandwidth settings over here. Uh, okay. Oops. Oh, too far. Hang on a sec. Okay, is the audio slightly better now? Stay from actually is no love. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me think. Um, I will. Let's see. I will turn my camera off, and I think I've lost your screen sharing. Sorry. Would you mind stopping and and starting your screen sharing again? Okay. Hmm. Okay. So I'm having problems on my side. Uh, I think is what's going on. Um, so we will wait for the maybe never to clear up for a couple of minutes. And in the meantime, maybe you can tell me a, how difficult was it to start learning more about how to do graphics in Emacs? Did you were there some resources that you found very helpful, or uh, a, a, maybe a sample code that you really liked? I did uh, in just search for how that was this. Um, this. This is the first time I'm that <laughs> you did assume this was all original. Um, there are actually a few other demonstrations I've seen before. Like, um, for example, uh, there's a, there's this Russian guy who did the SVG mode lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a great inspiration for me because he has a project where he is, for example, um, demonstrating SVG drawing like in a very, very simple vector application. Another one where he's just demonstrating what is possible with a display engine. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I did look a few a, a bit at uh, how he did all this and then later found a more fully featured demonstration of um, something like Blobby Volley. I don't know if you have actually played it, but it was very popular in my class, so I did immediately recognize it again. And yeah, so um, wow. I did look how it worked, I did compare with uh, SVG Clock, which is actually a package in GNU Alpha, Yeah. which you can check out. I try it had uh, this uh, in a uh, bug with a uh, selection, but otherwise it should work fine. And from there, I did learn that it wasn't really much to do. You had a step where you did um, generate the image data, and another one where you did uh, erase the buffer, insert, properties data, and yeah, wait a bit. And okay. so that's basically everything behind this. Sometimes you have to be very careful with um, speed, for example. You can't do anything that takes too much time, especially if you are um, regularly updating. Otherwise, Emacs can lock up. Mm -hmm. But uh, once you've got around this, it's mostly smooth sailing, as they say. Mm -hmm. OK, so now that screen sharing is, is back on for me, I, I can see how short that uh, that code is, really. Just as you said, it erases the buffer. It inserts some text with an image, uh, a display property, and, uh, and point entered, I guess, so people don't accidentally end up in the middle of it. 
and it's um, yeah. Enough. Awesome. Yeah, that's that, that's actually a bit slightly bit different. The thing is that um, if you do these things, then point moves. So if you, for example, manage to click between the end and the image, uh, you get a region which you can't easily deactivate, especially if it's updated very often. And so um, I'm using deactivate mark here and uh, make sure the point always moves away before display even has a chance to uh, show it. So um, this makes it look more like a game. I think mm -hmm. the next thing I'll try out is how to actually hide the cursor so that you don't uh, even get the idea to click there. And then I hope all my votes should be done there. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. So, yeah, maybe resizing. That could be difficult. I mean, um, in games, it's very common that you have uh, preset modes and full screen. Yeah. And uh, that's all you get. No flexible scaling or anything like this, though it seems to get better. So, okay. yeah, implementing okay. that would be a good exercise, I guess. <laughs> so, you presented this um, at, at, the, at, at, the, at the FOSS conference or something like that? Yeah, FROSCON. FROSCON. Okay. It's a free software, free and open source software conference in uh, Bonn. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, people meet up there to show all kinds of things. And um, I did want to give a talk for the Lisp room. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I did this this time and had that as topic because I've invested most of my time in it. And, <laughs> Were they yeah. similarly uh, um, amazed and not able to, to think of like more questions to ask you? Or were there a couple of good questions that came out of that? Um, no, I did have a few questions after it, but they mm -hmm. weren't really related to the talk. Mm -hmm. I did, for example, have someone who had showed me a rather puzzling problem with his um, um, input configuration. <laughs> and someone else who asked me about the state of Emacs development, but that was pretty much it. Okay. And, yeah. Okay, oh. and some new followers, but that doesn't really count. <laughs> uh, followers always count, I guess. But um, I, I, I suppose not a lot of people have gotten a chance to play around with graphics in Emacs yet. But knowing that it's, it's actually pretty straightforward, as you've shown, might get a lot more people into it. So aside yes, from... Really... Oh, go ahead. Uh, yes, it would be pretty cool because um, everything else are the built-in games, which sort of do that, but uh, do it in a different way. If you, for example, look at the uh, MetaX Tetris, mm -hmm. which was the original I've tweaked, um, it is doing it slightly differently. If you're in text mode, it's using a uh, propertized text, which is colored. But if you're in graphical mode, it takes uh, bits of text and adds a tile graphic to it. So um, they don't manipulate a single image, but many small images, which make up the whole grid. So um, mm -hmm. this this can work for simple puzzle games, but for anything more um, advanced, like something with sprites, that is an um, object that can move around freely in the game, this approach won't work anymore. So I did try this out to see whether I could surpass it. And okay. it's, it's, it's possible, but sort of difficult too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, this is so, the easy part of it. Ah, so the Tetris demo that you showed yesterday, uh, and if you want, you can yes. briefly show now, that's actually a single image as well, right? Uh, yes. Hmm, interesting. Yes. That means that yeah. if you have any, uh, any, say, breakout type things where you've got uh, balls going on the diagonal or uh, Pong, I guess, would, would also be one of those things. It's hard to represent if you're just doing text. Well, actually, Pong makes sense, makes, makes sense in text, but, uh, but you can do it more smoothly if it's a single image. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Uh, so let's see. So you. Oh, uh, th that would be great. Looking at the looking at the way it's actually implemented. Yeah, or just <laughs> basic demonstration of it. Um, yeah. Can this be displayed? Because last time I did, I had like a three-minute yes. pause until it was okay. No, it's, so, it's um, playing perfectly. Yeah. So um, this is the the basic game. You can move a piece around, you can rotate it. Okay, I can't really display that with a square block, but with this one, for example, you can rotate it both ways. And uh, I have soft drop, mm -hmm. and yeah, no hard drop yet, and no line clearing, and most of the other mechanics of the game, like no score subtract or anything. And currently, I'm not using any advanced animation, but I could. And um, I guess I'll show how this part of the game was implemented. Yes, so, um, yeah. 
So um, I did run into a bunch of problems with this thing because um, I did have to manipulate a lot more data than uh, with uh, the SVG game, mm -hmm. where I only had to um, um, see whether a block can be moved or not, because uh, there you have things like rotation and translation. So um, I had to work with vectors a lot, and I've discovered that in Emacs, you don't really have much utilities for working with vectors, mm -hmm. especially not if you wanted to be fast. So um, I did reinvent um, lots of common functions and uh, have accumulated enough to do a special utility library. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you have heard of dash.el. Yes. So this one would be v.el. And mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, it, uh, from from yesterday's talk on seek.el, it, it does sound like vectors are underappreciated. So I'm, I'm glad that you're getting uh, quite, a, quite a bit more performance than even if you had to write all of your own functions. And yeah, I, so. I think you also mentioned you've been teaching yourself all of this stuff, the math for it. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't much math, actually, but um, I had to teach myself how you would uh, re-implement these very, very basic things, like um, how would you create an empty vector grid with uh, elements that are independent from each other? Because um, in Tetris, you'd have a two-dimensional grid, and uh, you'd probably use the um, um, make vector function, where the initial piece would be uh, just a normal vector. But if you do this, you will notice that these vectors are all shared, because Emacs doesn't store these as vectors, but as pointers internally. Mm -hmm. So I had to figure out how I could create a grid that was really independent. And uh, this function, vgrid, this is actually what you would need to do. You could probably write it to be a bit more efficient, but it didn't make any practical difference here. So. Um, I would actually have a list, put, uh, put in it a vector, which uh, is independent, and then turn this list into a new vector. And doing this every time would need such a vector would have been really, really bothersome. So yeah, I did implement a function for it. <laughs> and a few more, like um, uh, nested axis and uh, modification of vectors. For this studying, uh, dash.l was very, very useful, because uh, my macrology is still improvable. I guess, but it does work. I'm not sure whether it's it's um, really, really useful there, but yeah, this is basically like um, the threading macros, which look like a pointy yeah. arrows in dash.dl, but used on vectors. Mm -hmm. Nice. So yeah, the implementation works basically like this. You would, ex you would expand to a recursive uh, versions of the macro and in the end, have what you'd need because this is a nested axis to a vector. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> I did learn a few other things like um, it's not there are not straightforward names for copying a vector. If you want to oh. do a deep copy of a vector, you need to copy a tree actually, as it turns out. And you don't need to just copy a tree; you need to use an optional attribute to tell it to copy vectors too. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, figuring out these kind of things that took way too much time and uh, yeah, I would have preferred that these were in a proper library like this one. So um, yeah, last thing I've implemented was basic iteration, like yes. uh, do it like macro, but for vectors and yeah, I yeah. guess I will have to do a few more. There are a bunch of libraries where I could steal from like um, a Scheme has, Scheme has a few very nice vector libraries, Closure has two. Common list pass, but uh, we already have an implementation of it, and it's not very efficient because it uh, just does it on a list and then turns it back to a vector. And I would really like to avoid this for something like a game. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was one of the stumbling blocks. I yeah. just did have to rewrite these and yeah, see what um, data structures can be used without too much pain because um, this is really the reason why you use lists all over the place. It's just <laughs> very convenient to do. Did you ever get a list or p list or anything? Yeah. Did you ever get a sense of the performance difference? If like if you had implemented this with lists, maybe or uh, compared to vectors, was your first implementation with lists, or did you jump straight to vectors? I did actually jump straight to vectors because it makes much more sense to keep it yeah. in there. So I didn't test this. I did only test my redrawing algorithms and uh, ways I, I I am actually manipulating the data. And yeah. yeah, there did run to a few things like, um, yeah, 
I did a scrape the initial algorithm for doing something like a game, just recreating a whole image and inserting it again. And uh, for this thing, I found out that this isn't actually fast enough. So I had to uh, figure out a trick to actually make this work. But um, yeah, wow. first of all, um, image is done here a bit differently. Um, and as I've said, an XPM is a string, basically. So um, I thought that instead of creating strings all over the place, I could just reuse one and uh, then abuse the fact that uh, strings in Emacs list are mutable. So I'm actually uh, doing something like an array access on this string and manipulating a bit in this. Because um, an XPM image pretty much looks like you'd have um, a header and then just a list of uh, ASCII, ASCII art-like stuff. And if you manipulate this, you actually can uh, shuffle uh, pixels around in it. So I'm doing this all the time. It's not very pretty, but it works fast enough. So <laughs> I'm doing this. Wow. OK, so let me see if I understand this correctly. Um, <laughs> so for performance reasons, you, you, you've really dug into how Emacs represents things internally, what, what's mutable, what isn't. And in this case, strings are working well for you. Uh, and I noticed that in your tile definitions, you're using, you, you basically define your pattern as characters using the question um, marks. Yes, text. yes, right. You, um, we have basically four types of tiles, like uh, this tile called X is just an empty tile where everything is a dot. And yeah. uh, there are a few others that uh, basically, uh, the first two look the same, just with uh, two different colors, like, uh, a would be a light one, B would be a dark one, and C would be one with a, a ring around um, something uh, bright. Yeah. yeah so yeah. yes, I'm turning these into images. Um, for this, I'm using an algorithm similar to uh, in, in the XBM live demonstration, mm -hmm. where I'm iterating over these and then upscaling with an integer diversion. So um, mm -hmm. yes, there's nothing interesting to be seen there. So um, <laughs> once I've had that going and uh, could actually put uh, tiles on the board, I did test how fast it would be to uh, just redraw the board every time, and it wasn't fast enough. So um, oh, I did this on it. Yes, it wasn't fast enough. So I did this on a timer, and uh, first I thought 30 FPS, which would be half of the original game speed, would be enough. But uh, it wasn't. It just locked up Emacs for me, and I had to kill it and start over again. And I found out that it is 10 FPS. In, if it's not byte compiled, and if it's byte compiled, 20 FPS, and both aren't fast enough in any case. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to find uh, something better than this. And I thought, actually, I don't need to redraw everything. I could do it like in the original Tetris game that's uh, shipped with Emacs and uh, just uh, do the redrawing manually. But that would, be, would have been not um, very... Uh, elegant, I'd just say, and I wanted something more automatic that's still efficient. So um, mm -hmm. I did think about this, and uh, then I remembered that there is a library in the JavaScript world known as React. Maybe mm -hmm. you've heard of it. It's, yes, it's been made yeah. by Facebook, yeah. and they've, they've created this thing to solve the problem that mm -hmm. um, doing manipulation of uh, their JavaScript apps the front-end code wasn't just fast enough, um, and it was sort of bothersome to just modify their DOM. This is basically a tree representing all the HTML elements in a website. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had an idea to um, don't do these uh, updates directly to the DOM, but do this to a virtual DOM. Yes. So um, they have this virtual tree, and so they have a bit more abstraction it with components and all that stuff. And uh, sometime it's time to uh, change the way these are displayed. So they uh, look at this at this virtual DOM, they compare it with the real DOM, and they figure out the differences, and then just repaint these. Mm -hmm. And this is a very very cool idea. So I thought, why not redo this here? Of course, in a more basic way because of this game. But this is what I've settled up for doing. Mm -hmm. And wait a minute, this would be just the drawing function. Or, ah, there it is actually. Um, yes, I've done this with two functions only. Doesn't quite fit on one screen, but anyways. Um, yeah, I have an old board state, which is just a deep copy of the uh, previous one. And these are two mm -hmm. nested arrays. So um, I, have, uh, I have introduced a flag, a so-called dirty flag. And 
This kind of thing is very common in uh, graphics programming that you um, have something telling that a redraw must be done. So um, every time this happens, I set this flag to a truthy value. So um, if this flag is set, I uh, take these two snapshots and I compare them, then find out the differences and push these to a list with the character of the tile that would need to be drawn instead. And this is later used uh, in the actual redrawing function. So it uh, checks the dirty flag, figures out these differences, and then if, um, oh, this is actually a bit more complex than, it, <laughs> than I'm explaining currently, <laughs> but um, it would just uh, take a look at every difference and repaint it only, then uh, yeah, create a new snapshot, and then do the uh, insert thing. And yeah, I've tried this, and this has been fast enough for 60 FPS. So um, yeah, downside with this is, of course, that um, it isn't perfect. If I would do full screen draws, like um, when I'm doing a title screen or switching to a randomized screen or anything like this, where I need to yeah. change almost everything, and if I do this often, it would be slow. Mm -hmm. But I don't do these often, so it's okay in this case, and I guess the retro games would do the same. Things that would change a lot on the screen happen less often, and things that change a little happen more often. So, yes, this does work out pretty well. The only annoying thing is that I have to um, set this flag often, like for every command that would uh, manipulate the display. But that's fine with me. So, yeah, I've added a few more things, like uh, skipping two rows because in the original Tetris, um, you actually have not a 10 times 20 grid, but a 10 times 22 grid. So you have two rows at the top, which are obstructed. Yes. And if you rotate a piece very quickly at the beginning, um, you don't see part of it. And this is because the other part is uh, drawn over it, but I don't have that at the moment, so I'm just skipping these two rows. And yeah, that's yeah. why it's a bit more complex than it should be. OK. And so yeah. So for performance reasons, instead of updating the entire XPM uh, data, you're just updating the regions that have changed, and you're doing yes. a, basically a diff in order to figure out which parts to do that. I guess the, the advantage also of, of how you've implemented it is, is that if you decide to implement a different grid-based game, you can easily reuse the, the function versus creating something that's specific for Tetris that you know takes advantage of the fact that all the changes are, are going to happen in a known region. So it makes sense to do it that way. Yeah, though I don't think I'll be doing any uh, framework or game engine or anything like this. <laughs> because um, it doesn't really feel reusable to me. And mm -hmm. uh, this has been the case for these retro games. I've actually looked at most of these were hand coded in assembly and not made to be reused again, which sort of makes sense for the hardware they're running on. but. Maybe you could do this. There has actually been an effort at uh, doing such a thing by uh, DTO, David O'Toole. You've probably heard of him because yes. he has done a lot of things with Org Mode. And yeah, he, he also has interest in uh, this game aspect of uh, Emacs and has released a prototype of a game engine called RLX. It lives on in a gist somewhere on GitHub. And yeah, it's unfinished. and. Later, he did redo this, but in common Lisp. So he put <laughs> Emacs into a common Lisp uh, program because uh, that felt easier to him, I guess. And I can't blame him really for this. But it's interesting that at least someone tried to do this. Yeah. So, yeah. I probably won't be the one to retry it. Maybe I will if I figure out how to use SVG better because it could solve a few limitations I have with my approach, but not for now. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to that too. It's 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 one of those things that's always fascinating to demonstrate to other people as a way of showing them that Emacs can actually do a heck of a lot. Certainly, if you come up with a graphical way to do artist mode, then I'm like, okay, here we go. Let's try drawing in Emacs instead. <laughs> yeah, that that is one of the maybe things on my to-do list: doing something <laughs> more advanced, like an actual drawing environment or. Um, let's just say something for authoring images. Like, um, mm -hmm. I um, I have this tendency to put animated GIFs on my uh, projects. Not <laughs> all of them, a few of them only, but um, I have used Photoshop for years. I have used GIMP for less, but I dislike both of them for uh, creating GIFs because it just doesn't feel natural at all and more like bolted on, even with the Gap plugin of GIMP. Yeah. And I figured that um, considering I have command line tools, I 
usually use to split and join these files. I could probably uh, use Emacs for the preview part and add a few key bindings and then have a better environment than both of them combined. <laughs> that would be pretty cool to have, but um, I'm not going to do this uh, any time soon. Maybe I later if I'm done with this game. I vaguely remember that you can actually watch animated GIFs inside Emacs. So, yes, uh, yes. and then you can you can even step forward and backwards through frames, which is more control than I I normally have with other applications. So uh, that'll be interesting. Yeah, to see. I would intend to use these. Um, these weren't available at the time I did uh, my first graphical demonstration. I did actually uh, use split frames and flipped through these with the same technique, and uh, that was fast enough to display a uh, keyboard cat. This <laughs> video you should know. <laughs> That's not fast enough for anything of higher resolution or uh, higher speed. So it would probably work for GIFs that aren't too large. <laughs> OK, here we go. Emacs is a high resolution, high frame rate uh, animation engine. I, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, to be honest, I'm, I'm pretty surprised that the display engine can actually deal with this without uh, going too crazy or like uh, flickering or anything like this. Maybe it's because the image doesn't ever change its size or isn't displayed in another place, but always in the same place at the beginning of the buffer. I don't know, yeah. honestly. I haven't really uh, taken a look at it because it's very, very complex code. I assume it's using similar tricks like uh, the ones I've used here, but of course on a much greater scale. And uh, yeah, well, maybe, I I'll, maybe I'll learn to understand it later. I look forward to your continuing experiments. I saw you were picking up some tips from demo scene programming uh, to, for, for interesting graphical effects. So we'll see uh, what Yes. Goes. Yes, uh, <laughs> someone did actually ask me, why not do a demo in Emacs? And I said, OK, maybe if we could skip the audio part, because that is a lot harder to do than the graphics part. And maybe if we don't do bitmap, because this is just too slow to uh, manipulate at a 60 FPS uh, full screen. And yeah, maybe the SVG type will solve this because uh, you just generate text. You don't actually have to manipulate anything, like uh, all individual pixels. And it already has a few tricks up its sleeve, like you can define a group of objects and then tell SVG to just repeat it or transform it or anything like this. And that mm -hmm. should already solve a bunch of headaches with it. <laughs> I'm not sure how well it would be suited for something like uh, a shooter or anything 3D because it would have to be pseudo 3D, but maybe it could work out. Maybe. Um, there's <laughs> this uh, Wikipedia page about the very first shooter, and it looks very basic. Maybe this could be implemented in Emacs. It's, uh, <laughs> just black and white with a few lines, and uh, you are in a maze. And uh, <laughs> shooting at things that look like floating eyeballs and that kind of stuff, it's pretty crazy. I can't yeah. remember its name currently, but you'll, you'll sure find it out there. <laughs> Maybe I can that'll, add later to yeah. this hangout. That'll, that'll certainly be a, a more impressive demonstration than animate string or animate birthday present. So I, I look forward to seeing that come out. <laughs> yeah, it would be pretty cool. Though um, I, I do remember that there, there's a Japanese guy. Uh, probably I'm not sure whether it's the same one that did this calendar plugin, but um, he did uh, some ASCII art uh, labyrinth thing. So mm -hmm. maybe I could steal the math part from this. Yeah, yeah. There was a there was a class even I think in animation in Emacs. I'll go dig up the, yes, the URL yes, and post that, that too. too. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned being impressed by the the display engine in Emacs. Are there other interesting things you've come across, whether or not they're related to graphics? You know, things that that made you go, "Hey, I didn't know Emacs could do that," or uh, or other things that you've incorporated into your workflow. Um, uh, yeah, for this one, I actually had to figure out how to use timers because um, it is one thing to just react to input. Like, uh, it's, ba it's a matter of just binding a command you've written to a key. That is very simple to do, and everything I had implemented in the live demonstration, the 2040 demonstration. But uh, mm -hmm. for, the, for the Tetris thing, I had to work with timers. You can basically tell Emacs to do things in either um, at a set interval periodically or if it has idled enough time, mm -hmm. like uh, saving your buffers every 300 seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so timers are pretty cool, actually. You can do something like uh, implement pseudo uh, asynchronous processing with them. I do even know a package that does this, 
which is very unpretty, but it works if you want to defer actions. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but I've run into a few problems with timers. Like um, if you have um, a few uh, more than a few timers with a very high resolution, uh, or rather very, with a very little interval, uh, it can lead to uh, display bugs like uh, your cursor flickering. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but um, this has annoyed me enough and I've tracked down packages doing this and have replaced them with other packages or even written my own in some cases. <laughs> and yeah, so um, I, I did have to figure out how I would use a single timer and uh, schedule animations and other things like that into Retris. And that took me a bit of time to figure out and um, I have uh, been inspired by another retro game trick for this. Yeah. Um, this is defined a bit uh, over this. We have time and amount of and an amount of ticks. So um, every time a frame is rendered, uh, this counter is incremented by one. So um, this will eventually um, over um, uh, go into the negative values. Right. But uh, it doesn't really matter here because um, we're doing this a bit differently. Um, I have a list of scheduled events here, and each of these is a vector containing uh, a few informations, like um, what interval this uh, event has to be run at, uh, what the condition is to run it at, and uh, what function should be run. So um, I'm always check. I'm repeatedly checking uh, these events, and uh, then return a list of events that have to be run, and mm -hmm. use this for the game scheduler. So. What's basically happening here is uh, that uh, if we, for example, have uh, told this that um, every time 50 frames have passed and the remainder of dividing the uh, amount of ticks by 50 has to be zero, we would run a function moving the piece down in this game. Mm -hmm. So we could combine this with a few more, um, like for enabling animations. So I could add another event, um, like for example, if um, uh, the piece has uh, completely arrived at the bottom. I would mm -hmm. um, add one function that would check whether uh, mm -hmm. uh, lines have to be removed and uh, then make this flash these lines. So that would be a way to uh, have animation in there. And this is basically a slightly smarter implementation of timers, which does not rely on running many of these concurrently. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've basically remitted with that in a slightly better way for this. and. This is one of the things I've actually learned from here because later I've uh, checked out this and found out that it's not too different from what I've done. Hmm. It's actually also keeping a list of these things with vectors in them, but uh, it's it's running them slightly differently. Okay. So yeah. So let me get this straight for you for Retris, you're you're actually keeping your own scheduler instead of running the running different timers to to update yes. things. Okay. What's it? Do you, do you remember off the top of your head what the granularity of an Emacs timer is? Do you, can it deal uh, with microseconds or is it seconds or? Oh, you can you can actually uh, go to milliseconds intervals. Mm -hmm. Everything okay. below this will probably lock it up yeah, completely. Yeah. So, um, uh, I for example seen amounts like ten milliseconds or even one at, um, yeah. for some codes, but nothing below. So yeah, if you're doing these, uh, make sure you're not doing too much in this function. Otherwise, you can just lock everything up. And if you do something like um, uh, entering the debugger for this function, you are debugging and uh, press Q to quit it. It isn't run anymore after this. <laughs> and, yeah, this is this is kind of weird compared to a real traditional game development environment like something yeah. like Common Lisp or Scheme where you actually get a helpful debugger that doesn't halt your complete game after this, but <laughs> yeah, it's part of Phoenix, I guess. <laughs> well, it'd be interesting to, to see the, the kinds of uh, debugging tips and tricks you can uh, you can write about when you when you write a blog post about the different things you've learned doing this. Wow. Very cool. Okay, so I, I noticed also you use a, a couple of, of little things to make your development easier, like the rainbow parentheses to show different colors for different nesting levels. Are there other things that you use to make uh, make your Emacs list development easier? Well, um, as I mentioned before, I have started off with Wim, so I was very used to its key bindings and have went for evil. I'm using this for navigation, editing, everything like this. So um, yeah, it's very, 
very basic them editing. The upside is, of course, that I don't really have to think about it, which is great for me. But uh, I don't have any of these tricks like um, multiple cursors or smart parents or pirate it up my sleeve. So it looks a bit awesome. more boring than uh, other other people editing. So um, yeah, <laughs> my customizations are more about um, the workflow. Like yeah. um, I'm using Helm very extensively like for switching buffers or checking out uh, what timers have run out of control or other things like these. And uh, yeah, I'm currently hacking on a, a replacement for it, which is a bit more lightweight and mm -hmm. uh, doesn't have that much bug uh, potential because it's less lines of code. But um, yeah, these are what I'm mostly using. On this, um, I have set up Hydra yeah. for um, putting things on the F keys. So um, I have organized my key bindings by putting these on clusters of F keys, like F1 is for all the help things, or F2 would be for uh, customization and package related stuff, and so on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this has been a great, great productivity improvement for me. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, sometimes they write small functions like something for uh, displaying uh, the info manual or resuming a Helm session or stuff like this, but it's mostly standards. So yeah, what else is there? Um, I'm using smart mode line, yeah. which uh, is a cleaned up version of the original mode line in, in colors. It's less fancy than a power line, for example, but um, it's, it's basic enough for me and helpful. So I've gone with this instead of obsessing over uh, the right <laughs> style for the delimiters for power line. <laughs> Maybe I'll write my own uh, mode line because um, this is SVG mode line, but uh, it's too much bells and whistles for me. I'd rather use um, SVG to uh, overcome the problems of the original mode line, like um, mm -hmm. it being very, very limited in terms of font fallback, for example, or that it's just one line. Like uh, if you would have a two line high, uh, high mode line, you could, for example, put something else into it than just the current information. Like, um, for example, your current system statistics or something like this. Actually, or maybe permanent messages or I don't know. It would, of course, uh, yeah, allow a lot of research. What could else put there? Because uh, abusing the header line is, I don't know, a <laughs> bit unreliable for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can see how you might use a, a display property to have like even just really tiny text or, or other status images uh, on your mode lines. So we'll see where that goes. Do you share yeah. your Emacs config anywhere? Uh, yes, yes, I have it on GitHub. I have a bunch of things there because um, I'm not only developing uh, fun stuff that is uh, not really useful for others, but rather cool to look at. Like um, I have developed two packages for window management. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, one of these would be um, eyebrows, which I use for uh, managing window configurations. Like uh, if I would first and a second, it's much more convenient than using registers because uh, it does remember to save and load these for you. Mm -hmm. I have another one for um, dealing with um, popped up buffers, shackle, and other than that, a few other small packages, like one for running things on saving, known as Firestarter. And uh, I've ported the theme and oh, done a bunch yeah. more. Yeah, Firestarter. I came across that before. It's you know, it, it looks like a really interesting way to make things happen when you save. So that's good stuff. Well, yes, I, I did just wonder why nobody has really implemented this properly yet. I've bothered um, compiling a list of all the alternatives and how they uh, don't, uh, how they aren't as uh, powerful as mine. And yeah, <laughs> so. This this one works for me pretty well, and uh, I find it cool that other people think the same way. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so uh, in terms of packages you re you'd recommend or, or that you really like using, you've mentioned Helm, and and you've developed quite a few packages as well that uh, that other people can check out. Are there other you know key recommendations you would like to encourage people to go and check out? Uh, yeah, of course, Magit, for example. I mean, Magit. Mm -hmm because um, it's just simply the best Emacs user interface I've ever seen. <laughs> it is very, very helpful. Even with, the, 
Yes, even with a 2.1 rewrite, which did change a few things. Like, um, it did introduce a few more helpful hints, like uh, this selection thing, mm -hmm. which uh, I had actually reported a few bugs for. Yeah, like uh, it's drawing two thin lines around what you've selected to make clear that you're only committing this part. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but it's it has changed a lot. Like um, other key bindings that used to work uh, don't work the same way as before. Like um, if I check out a new branch, uh, I can end up with a detached head instead of just creating it, which is sort of weird and a few others. But overall, it's been very, very much worth it for me. Cool. So yes, as of other packages, well, awkward, of course. Yeah. <laughs> You can just use it the way you need it. Like I use it very minimally, just for presentations and documentation and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I have seen a lot of setups from other people have made a lot more with it. And this is pretty amazing, especially if you consider how complicated its, its implementation is, or just extending it, that, that people still can make really, really much with it. Yeah, it, 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 it's very complex internally, but when, when you're using it, the, the key bindings are very consistent and the behaviors, it, it becomes a little easier for people to deal with. Yes, yes, that's pretty, pretty great. Maybe it's the second best interface I've seen in Emacs. <laughs> Don't know. But well, yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to giving your literate configuration a good read. And I saw some interesting snippets in there. Like you, you actually, do you still use uh, typing of Emacs often? <laughs> Oh, no, I, I did just <laughs> set up its uh, config file to be somewhere less. I did yeah. use it when I wasn't really good at touch typing to improve this, but I don't know, maybe there's uh, something <laughs> better than just typing uh, one-shot words for this. Yeah. Oh, maybe, uh, or maybe you'll, you'll you know, play around with adding graphics to it or something else. Maybe. Uh, Who knows? That's super cool. OK, so your, your uh, GitHub, by the way, it's also at Wasamasa. So I'll, I'll add the link to that, and, and people can go explore. But it's great to yeah. see all the different things that you've put in there. And, and of course, the, the graphics demonstrations and the walkthrough through the code. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah so before, um, before we wrap up, do you have any other tips for people who are maybe getting started or or trying to move beyond being just a beginner at Emacs. What helped you do that You know, one year, two year, three year transition? Well, um, I don't really have any tips for this because um, Emacs is after all very, very large. So um, for me, it was more of a thing like, um, don't try to understand it all at once. Uh, mm -hmm. You um, don't uh, customize too much at first because you can get stuck there forever. And uh, yeah, tackle it uh, one piece at one time. Like uh, if you want to know how to have uh, a prettier theme and a prettier look, concentrate on this first before you uh, get hung up with uh, fixing bugs in it or in packages you're using, because otherwise you're not going to get anywhere with this. And mm -hmm. yeah, because, because of my tendency to get stuck in other things, I've actually started a blog about it. I guess you've heard it. It's uh, emacshorrors.com. It's a very different kind of blog uh, compared to other Emacs blogs because um, I rant there about um, horrible things I find in its sources. And uh, this, this happens to me rather often. Like um, uh, at my job, I uh, had to start a C-sharp project. So first thing I did was installing C-sharp mode. And when I booted it up for, for editing a C-sharp file, I did just notice that it didn't initialize its mode properly because it wasn't initialized correctly in it. So the first thing I did was looking at its code, fixing it, do the pull request, and yeah, saying that off. And this happens to me very, very often. So wow. I did. I started a blog about this. I have a proper blog too, which uh, is much more recent. So it just has one article yet. But um, anyhow, if you're interested in uh, yeah, unusual topics about Emacs or just more advanced stuff. I'd recommend you to check these out. So what was that URL again? Um, emacshorrors.com. And the other one was emacsninja.com. Emacs heroes? Sorry. Emacs horrors. Horrors. Horrors, uh, like in horror movies. Oh, uh, horrors. OK, yes. all right. Emacshorrors.com. And, uh, and the other one was emacs. Ninja. Ninja. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's what I've had there. I've I've read an interesting article where uh, someone described uh, um, 
ninjas as uh, V users, SPI users, and uh, Emacs users as pirates. And uh, sorry, thought if I'm using evil, I must be an Emacs ninja. <laughs> and that was the name for it. <laughs> All right. OK, so that's where people can go find you on the internet. You're either on IRC as Lassa Massa or at emacshorrors.com or emacsninja.com. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, folks, if you're listening and if you have further questions, you can drop by aforementioned Emacs Horrors or Emacs Ninja or, or IRC to, to follow up. But in the meantime, enjoy and um, and keep having fun with Emacs, I guess. I'm going to stop the broadcast here now. YouTube will have the archive and um, we'll see you around for the next uh, Emacs Chats or Emacs Hangouts. <laughs>